welcome to Coming Down to Earth, an online conflict transformation summit to explore pathways towards regenerative cultures in a divided world. My name is Nuno da Silva, and I'm here today with a wonderful, very interesting person, Vanessa Andriotti. Welcome, Vanessa. Vanessa is speaking from British Columbia, right? Where are, where are you touching the ground? I'm going from Vancouver. Vancouver. So I'm in Faro, in the south of Portugal. So from across the Atlantic, uh, welcome. Vanessa, I'm going to talk to you a bit, tell you a bit about Vanessa, but I hope she will tell us a bit more as, as a segue to this. But Vanessa, is a, you are a Canada Research, research Chair in Race, Inequalities and Global Change. You are a Research Fellow at the University of Oulu where you used to be a share of global education from 2010 to 2013. And you are a research fellow at the Center for Global Citizenship Education at the University of Alberta. Now, what is interesting is that you've been dedicating your time, a lot of your time, to research, uh, examining the historical and systemic patterns of reproduction of inequalities and how these limit or enable possibilities for collective existence and global change. Your publications in this field, which are tremendous, I really advise everybody to have a look at some of them, include analysis of political economies of knowledge production, discussions of the ethics of international development, and critical comparisons of ideals of globalism and internationalization in education and in global activism, with an emphasis on representations of and relationships with marginalized communities. Whoa. I think it is, doesn't sound as good as if you tell us a bit like what, in, what, is, what has made you in your life journey to, to go on this, on this walkabout to, to such a complex and, and uh, challenging uh, field of research and, and really, I would say, kind of marginal if we think that of, that's not, not at all, uh, it's actually be bringing a critical perspective to the dominant views. So could you tell us a bit, like, what, what led you to this, to, to this pathway? Okay, so I will just start by saying that I'm, I'm speaking from uh, the Musqueam Reserve, uh, the university where I work, which is very close to here, UBC, is located on unceded indigenous lands of the Musqueam people. And they, they asked us to to talk about that when we start any conversation. So Thanks just for, for that, acknowledging that. That's really important. <laughs> that it is, it's important. Yeah, and they, they say that uh, they would like us to say that um, they are speakers of the whole Camillan language and the language is very much alive and they are here resisting as well. And um, in relation to that, there's another land acknowledgement that I have to do, which comes from... Um, my community, I'm, I'm from Brazil, my family is um, part uh, of German ancestry, part of indigenous ancestry. So the acknowledgement that I learned there is that first you need to acknowledge the land as a living entity, not as property or resource. It's something that sustains us and we are an extension of the land rather than the other way around. The second acknowledgement is an acknowledgement that there has been a lot of violence uh, systemic, historical, ongoing violence that is required for us to be here and that this is unsustainable. We will have to face the consequences of this at some point, but we need to acknowledge uh, to acknowledge that when we meet. The third acknowledgement is the acknowledgement that um, our ancestors may have planned what is going on right now and uh, also the people in our families who have supported us to be here. So I also have to acknowledge Nuno for the opportunity to be having this conversation. And from their perspective and from my perspective, this is a sacred space for a conversation. It's something that deals with what we need to have reverence for, which is life. And the last acknowledgement is that we are all parentes. Uh, parentes doesn't translate exactly as um, relation or, or, or family. It's more kinship. We all part of the same metabolism that is currently sick. And if the metabolism is sick, we are sick as well. And we, we have to, to meet in the responsibility for healing, for healing each other. So 
this is the acknowledgement I learned there. It's a long one. Thank you <laughs> but, so much. Uh, Thank you. It is part of, um, part of the story, I think, of why I'm doing this. So I think I was born into this. My father of German ancestry in the 60s in Brazil was observing his brothers being involved in the agrarian reform movement of indigenous genocide, and he was against that, and he wanted to make a stand. So he decided to marry uh, an indigenous person to make that position clear in his family that he was not uh, accepting that. But he also wanted in this marriage to help indigenous people have whiter kids and have more opportunities, which can be considered very problematic. So I was born out of an initiative that was very progressive, that wanted to change the world, but in a very problematic way, in a very, in a, in a racist way, basically. But he doesn't see that as racist. He just saw that that's the normal way that the people all around, that's the universal way to go. And my mom accepted that because she also associates indigeneity with dispossession, with destitution, with uh, having been born in the streets. And she, she didn't want that for her future generations, right? Although my grandmother, my indigenous grandmother was saying, this is a trap. This social mobility thing is a trap. Look at what's happening to the land. This is unsustainable. This is not going to last. At one point, we will all have to pay for this. So in my family, I had this spread of different um, aspirations, some people aspiring for social mobility, others resisting that. And I could see the effects of that on people. And from a very early age, I had to develop a very different kind of sensibility because this relationship is actually quite violent, both psychologically and sometimes physically. So in order to be able to live in an environment of constant conflict, I had to figure out a way to survive, to be a little bit sane, <laughs> but a little bit not sane as well, but to be able to negotiate my way and navigate this complexity. And a lot of it was about also blaming myself because I thought that was a problem with me. And it was only later in life that I figured out that what was I saw in my family was a mirror of what was happening in society. And then I decided to study it, to study why uh, there is a single story of progress, development, and evolution. Why some people feel that they are the apex of this evolution, they are leading the evolution, like uh, my my dad's culture. Why was that? And then I started looking at how, in, through my work with the British Council, how English schools would have be teaching that through textbooks and teachers through teachers' narratives also to students. And then I saw that it was even even much wider than that. I wanted also to understand why some people on the other side also wanted that, wanted uh, to be white or to have the same uh, entitlements, knowing that these entitlements are violent against other people. So I was really interested in the dynamic of, uh, of how this uh, sense of self was created in relation to each other and in relation to the planet, in relation to this metabolism that my grandmother kept warning us about, that this is not going to last, <laughs> don't, don't go in that direction, it's dangerous. And I think uh, working with global education and global citizenship education in institutions was one of the ways that I found to explore this um, with a critical lens. Uh, as a teacher, I, I, I did that as a practitioner too. Um, but the work at the university, uh, although I was pushing back against it all the time, actually created the possibility to to have certain conversations that, um, in circles of practitioners, were not were not being possible. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's part of the story. Wow! Uh, amazing. I'm I'm. Yeah, where where to start from there? Perhaps one of the things is you've we we were talking as a preparation for the interview that that we there's no there's not going to be and I I think that's that's also, also true for the summit as a whole that this is there's no promise of an easy easy way out or a, 
of a simple simple formulas that can get us out of trouble. We we will we will be we'll continue to meet trouble no matter what. That's one of the things. Mm -hmm. But the other is a lot of the trouble we are in is is like uh, rippled over the past or it's ripples from the past and somehow it's going to be rippling into the future. So I guess this is a, a this this is a conversation that that in a way will will be an, um, yeah will, will be complex, not easy at times, and and I guess it's also honoring the reality that that's that's the way things are. So no matter how much we try to simplify them, but perhaps you could talk a bit about some of your research around. Um, particularly decolonization and, and how you see the problematic ways in which we think about issues like how to produce knowledge, how to know things and like education, whatever. Feel, feel free to just share a bit of, of that okay. in light of also conflict and what the topic of the summit, sure. right? So um, I work, I've worked for the last, five or six years with a group of people that then consolidated into what we call today the decolonial futures, uh, gesturing towards the colonial futures collective. And there's a reason why the gesturing is there. And uh, this collective works at the interface of questions of systemic, historical, and ongoing violence and questions of unsustainability. And it's very difficult to find people working at that interface. Uh, and the other thing that we we try, to, we try to do at that interface is to figure out how to hold space for difficult conversations without relationships falling apart. So the part of conflict about us not being able to sit together is, is, is key to, to the work that we do, the experiments that we do in the collective. And we are informed by some literature on the colonial um, Decolonial studies, uh, studies on decolonization, indigenous literature, abolitionist studies, um, critical race studies. But the most part of what we do pedagogically is coming from collaborations with indigenous communities. Um, and the, the main thing that we've learned in these collaborations is that they have a very different way to integrate the unconscious in what they do. So we're paying attention to how in Western education, we we don't develop any, um, uh, we're not equipped to deal <laughs> with the unconscious and how in indigenous cultures, and, and, and they have practices that integrate um, what happens in there. So if we're going to, if we're going to talk about like a, 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 the unconscious, we're talking about psychoanalysis, but what we're doing uh, is not based on Western psychoanalysis, although sometimes we do have interfaces with that. It's a non-Western form of psychoanalysis that centers the land as a living metabolism that is bio-intelligent. So that is the understanding that we find um, in the collaborators, in the indigenous communities we work with. And oh, we look can, at their can, practices. Can you just make a parenthesis, yeah. Vanessa? Because you said a term there that is, it's kind of, it's, it's very uh, unusual. You said that the, the play, that they look at an ecosystem, like the place as bio-intelligent. Was that what you it's said? Like, so yes. that <laughs> means that on one side, from what I hear, just to be clear, that means that, yes, definitely we know humans are not only intelligent beings, other living creatures are also intelligent, but then that there's also an intelligent that holds the whole thing together. Is that, am I right yeah. in kind of, okay. Yes, yes. There is an intelligence <laughs> beyond the form that we take. Okay. There's an intelligence of movement beyond the form that we take. And um, this biointelligence can work, it, it's working through us all the time anyway, but it can work through us uh, for change in the ways that we want change to happen if we declutter the unconscious. Right now, in the project, we say there's a lot of shit, uncomposted shit, that we need to <laughs> compost in the unconscious. It's super cluttered. It's like the pipes are all up. And uh, this affective side, and when I say affect, I'm not saying just emotions, because we tend to think about emotions as 
abstract thing. When we talk about effects, these are neurophysiological discharges. So we are neurophysiologically, neurochemically restricted to deal with the shit because of the socialization we've had for the past 200 or 500 years yeah. with the enlightenment and the universal reason and trying to uh, index reality in language so that we can control this reality, predict this reality, engineer. So break reality in parts and uh, exactly. have and this kind the, of deterministic understanding of, of cause, the cause and effect, right? Yes. Yeah. So we've been over-socialized into that, and I'm not saying that that's not important. Like, for mm-hmm. building a, a plane, that is important, <laughs> but for building a relationship, that might not work, right? So uh, it's about the, the scale of things and the space it takes in our being. We have also been uh, socialized to reduce our being to that knowledge, to knowing. We, we relate through the world to the world through knowledge, whereas... If we integrate the unconscious, there are many ways of relating that are not captured in meaning. We are relating all the time. Mm -hmm. And our bodies are receiving uh, information all the time of the kind that we can no longer respond to because we are so addicted to reducing things to meaning that what we don't find meaningful is just erased, Mm -hmm. right? All the other senses that do not relate through meaning they deactivate or they atrophy. So part of the process to be able to compost that shit is to reactivate the capacities that have been exiled by the socialization, right? We call this socialization a socialization in a house, a house of modernity with a foundation that uh, is also something that we understand colonialism to be the foundation of the house. And this foundation is, uh, it, it relates to symptoms and causes of a disease, uh, the disease of feeling ourselves as separated from this metabolism. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like at the root of the colonial, of colonialism, that's, that's that sense of separation, yeah. right? So the occupation of land and the turning of land as property and also the subjugation of people are symptoms of that separation, sense of separation, because we're not separated. Yeah, yeah, so it's uh, an imposed sense of separation that then um, it, it extracts the intrinsic value of life. So it, it, at first it puts humans at the center. So it's all about human exceptionalism, humans being exceptional because they are the only intelligent beings or the only ones who can rationalize. And so whatever uh, explanation mm-hmm. there is, it can be a, a religious explanation for why humans are the most important animals. From that, uh, that separation from the, the wider metabolism and the parity and equanimity with everything else creates um, an extraction of intrinsic value. And when you don't have that intrinsic value, you have to produce value to, to uh, get some external validation and to justify why you deserve to be alive. Right? So you have to be producing values in, value in different economies. And one of the things that we do in the project that is a bit different from what other people do, we also cross it with neuroscience to say that this separation is not a thinking thing. It's a neurophysical thing. So it could be we are trying to theorize it in terms of a deficiency in the production of serotonin, right? Mm -hmm. And an addiction to dopamine and oxytocin. So changing thinking may not... um, change this neurophysiology and they not need to neurogenesis. There's something much deeper that needs to be shifted, including a layer of affective patterns, patterns like feedback loops related to traumas, to insecurities, to fundamental fears, like the fear of death, the fear of loss, the fear of pain, the fear of scarcity, worthlessness, and then you name it. That is all there, right? And um, personal trauma and collective trauma that we have not been able to touch, right? So we need to figure out the capacity to be able to hold space so that we can process that, compass that, so that we can have some fertile soil to be able to be together. And it's enormous task that not many people want to do. People really want candy, (laughs) 
they want the simple solution, the feel good, look good, and like yeah, especially in our times, the, right? Is the mm-hmm. all about being positive, move and forward, we all, toxic we all positivity. About we also grow up thinking of or grow up uh, having this kind of sense of avoiding the things that cause us pain, right? That's that's a kind Absolutely. of also, and, and Our Western relationship to pain says that well-being is only achieved when we are pain-free, whereas in other cultures that's not the case at all. Pain is is a fact of life, and it's there for many different reasons. Yeah. And you need to change your relationship with it. But imagine a situation where everybody is really afraid of the pain of that cluster in the unconscious, and they're saying, "No, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna be." meeting with each other and we're going to work together. But this work together is based on a projection. It's like a Hollywood script of what would happen if we could avoid all of that, right? And then there is this um, consumption. It's an addiction to consumption of experiences, of knowledge, of relationships, but mostly of validation. So I just engage in a relationship so that I can receive the validation because actually, my sense of worthlessness and meaninglessness and insignificance and impossibility, it's all enormous in my unconscious, mm-hmm. right? And that, that then starts to drive the relationship, which, especially... Which is some t- somehow it's strongly catalyzed by the disconnect, right? If you are not, if you, are, if you don't, you often not feel part of the larger uh, life uh, and the people around you in a community, then you are displaced. You... Yes. Yeah, the isolation. Right? Yeah. We are living in hyper-individualistic times. We are living in hyper-narcissistic times, too. So social media is um, leading us to create these this images and feel entitled to, uh, to get the world to see us as we want to be seen, mm-hmm. right? And this is not a healthy pattern if you want to declutter and compost things. This is something that needs to, to reach a tipping point. So so that you can say, this is not working anymore for me, I need something else. And that's one of the difficulties we have. When we work with groups interested in change, like transition towns or um, movements interested in change in education, like Ecoversities, for example, when I think of the difficulties is that a lot of people go to these movements as a way of escaping that clutter. They want change so that they can feel better about things. But there are certain things we need to feel over the, the, the shape that are not that good, but we need to figure out a way of feeling that so that we can process it. And then you have spaces where people are trying to run away from that, to avoid that. And then you bring people from other struggles. So one of the other things we see is that if you bring people together from low intensity struggle, so people who have choices, who are going into alternatives as a matter of choice, in people in high intensity struggle who don't have a choice, they have to fight for survival. Yeah. And you put them together in the same space, and a lot of interesting but very painful and difficult things happen. And we are not equipped to hold space for that because the, some patterns keep happening, and it's very difficult to interrupt them when they are already happening. So, what we are trying to do with this kind of decolonial work, one of the things we're trying to do is figure out what kind of how can we create a space where the shit can be composted at the right time, but where also we have the vitality, the serenity, the sobriety to stay with it until it's composted, right? It's a, we need stamina and resilience for the long haul of this process. And the more we are attached to the simplistic solutions, to the validation, feel good, do good, look good, move forward, the further away we are from the actual work that needs to be done. So we always say we need to figure out how to show up differently for this work where our fragilities don't get centered as the thing that stops the work from being done. In in that sense, we need to remember that the socialization within modernity, within the the uh, the enlightenment, one way, um, totalizing universal forms of knowledge and we're going to get there by the building blocks, it has actually infantilized us to the, in, in terms of not equipping us to face the complexity, the paradoxes, the uncertainty. And in, in calibrating our desire to want comfort, 
She wants to be cuddled. She wants to be validated. So it's, a, it's, it's like dealing with a toddler inside of ourselves who really wants the candy. <laughs> and then what we can offer in this other work is the possibility of planting broccoli when the shit is composted and turned into new soil. So it's a very different offering. And most people, when they wake up to what's happening in the world and they want change, they want candy. They don't want broccoli. Even when they want to permaculture. Still, permaculture then becomes the candy that makes them feel bad. Yeah, just want, we just want the new, the new big thing that is going to save the day, you know, and and save the world. And then there is this, this elevation, right? So there is this elation. Yeah, super excitement. Let's do it. And then something happens. Like the first disappointment. It falls There's apart. There's this huge disillusionment. Depression. Right? And, and yeah. depression. And then there's no way to get out of that. It becomes a dip. I have a, full, uh, a picture that tries to... I'll, I'll just... Show, to show us, it. show us. Uh, with you. Here. Yeah. Is it there? Yeah. Okay, so here you have the, the person waking up saying, Yeah, I need something different, but then there, there are promises of easy and self satisfying solutions, and there's this elation, and then the ditch that can become a ditch, and the people can die in that ditch with complexities, uncertainty, paradox, sustainable conflicts, and pushback. That if you're not equipped to deal with and to hold space for, it's just going to, to kind of bury you under that. Um, and it, you, what you can hear, which is different, which is interesting, is that a lot of people think, well, we need to feel good because of that, because we don't have the equipment to to deal with this, right, to the complexity. We say something different. We say, actually, we need to make space for us to create the conditions and the capacities to deal with that before we get excited about anything. Because if we get excited from this other space of trying to avoid the shit, we're going to get into that dip and we're going to hurt uh, because the fall is, 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 a, is a big fall if you're very elated. Because yeah. the, the journey itself is going to be bumpy and yeah. it's going to be, in the long term, it's going to be uncomfortable. But it, it doesn't have to be like this, like a, a roller coaster. It can be just a few hills that you have to, that we have to to walk and dance with together. So we need stamina, we need integrity, we need sobriety, we need serenity, we need patience, <laughs> generosity, compassion, and responsibility or accountability. But this cannot be intellectual choices. You cannot be doing this to feel virtuous. Otherwise, you're back into the first hill, the first big hill, right? So one of the things I notice in this image that is not there is is uh, safety and and that that might yes. worth that might worth yes. a couple of words because I've noticed that for in the Western world security is a very big uh, issue like everybody is talking yeah. about the need to create a safe space but I yeah. think maybe in, in the indigenous region. places that's not I mean there's no there's not a lot of safe places so maybe safety is not the an issue has become a priority <laughs> mm. in certain cases yes i think when when we're we're in the interface yes mm -hmm. but most of our collaborations is with indigenous people and other indigenous people so there there is already an understanding that um it's not safety that is the priority actually it's something yeah the this relationship with the metabolism is the priority. So they say that there's individualism, there's collectivism, which is part of our vocabulary to talk about mm. social change. But they say there's individualism, collectivism, and metabolism. So if we're not attuned to the metabolism, the, nothing's going to work really well in terms of genuine change in terms of these other two possibilities, right? Mm. So, for example, when we had... The first time we had a, a meeting about a research project, there was a call here in Canada for a research project. And I, I took it to the network and I said, would you like to do something about it? And uh, 10 indigenous communities said, yes, we would like to do it. So we organized the gathering and it was a five day gathering. And when we arrived there, the first thing that they wanted to do was rapé. Have you ever done rapé? It's um, it's yeah, nothing. Yeah. You put yeah, something the in your nose. Yeah, on the on the yeah. It's strong. It's and you, you get it. 
it is super intense for five minutes and you get it really grounded. And from there, it was, it's rapé, going to the waterfall, coming back from the waterfall, having a ceremony and another one and another one. By day four, I was having a great time, but I thought this is not going to be any project out of this because <laughs> we've had four days of ceremonies and this would have taken at least like three days to write it together. It, it's not going to happen. But it's fine. Okay, we're not going to put a proposal together. And I've just had an amazing, an amazing experience. But on the last day, they said, let's now, we have three hours to sit together to talk about it. And what happened was incredible. Because the relationships were attuned, because we were attuned with what was happening in that land, it just came. It flowed. Three hours, it yeah. just flowed. And there, there, was no, um, there was no mistrust. Um, there was no, um, this, there was just healthy skepticism about things, but no toxic uh, skepticism. There was no, um, it, it was something I had never experienced before. I wouldn't have never been able to write what I wrote in three hours with them in a university environment. Because the projections too, they, they had the interrupted projections. Here, if you try to do uh, research with a number of people from different countries, everyone will try to project on to that proposal what they want for their ego, for their career, for their what they tried to avoid in the unconscious. There was none of that there. So everybody was ready to pay attention to something else and to see how that project could benefit the metabolism. That was what was that, um it's interesting called in the take that because that, that's part of what i'm learning to do with regenerative development is that kind of of being in that kind of place of, of thinking in that way what an, another wonderful thing is we had we just we had a conversation uh for another conversation for the summit where this topic of the container was very was very explore, was explored in a bit of that how important it is and the, uh, the the welcoming, you know, the all the things that allow people to be really grounded and present and in connection, so that then you can you can have the conversations that matter in a way that is really uh, serving. So it's yeah, just well. magic because it's neurochemical, right? <laughs> but then again, when you are starting, so. Between the communities, it was one thing. When you try to bring some of the people from these communities in the context of the university with more academics, for example, there will be a lot of mistrust that is historical mistrust. So if academics were welcoming them in a, in a certain way, they would be suspicious. And that wouldn't necessarily help with them feeling more at ease. <laughs> they would say, okay, there's something wrong here. Right, so how to how to build trust first? In, in, in but is, what, I mean, uh, that example you give is interesting because if I recall well, I've been out of the academia world for a long time. But if I recall well, some of the ceremonies and and welcoming uh, rituals of university they are actually much more about you know clarifying who has rank and who has not and who has the power and and privilege than actually really welcoming people to a space of of communion let's say so this there's different changed. rituals so yeah that's really but you so the university as an ivory tower i agree it was like that but the university now is a supermarket mm. and there are different aisles Right. So there's the community engagement aisle, for example, that will appropriate any strategy there are there to make it look like it's a horizontal space. And indigenous people have the radar. They can see through the crap, basically, <laughs> and say, you're being overly positive. <laughs> you're being overly welcoming. There's a problem there. So they would be either then restraining themselves or rolling their eyes <laughs> and the, the idea I think that one of the things we're trying to do in the project in the projects related to the decolonial futures collective is to try to develop in people the ability for them to read better what's happening but also read how they are being read right 
from the perspective of high intensity struggles, from the perspective of people who uh, they haven't had the, the life experience of. So in a, and, in a way to develop their capacity to feel empathy, right? To be able to kind of imagine it, what it would be, what is what, what would be the perspective from the other person in this coming from this context. Empathy is more like empathy is generally talked about as projective empathy. So you're still getting your unconscious to project mm -hmm. something. We're talking more about tuning in tuning to the in. physiological responses. So we create exercises where there's one exercise called Raiders, for example, where we try to put them in the same position where they would be rolling their eyes at themselves and see how ridiculous <laughs> things are, but using humor as well to say this is this can't be a policing or a, a stick exercise. This is about us understanding that we are all cute and pathetic, and we just need to figure out how to grow up together. This is going to be ridiculous for some time, and it's actually funny <laughs> that it is ridiculous, as ridiculous as it, as it is right now. But um, the Raiders exercise might be a good exercise for people to try. Uh, we tried to figure out 16 contexts where people who are in low intensity struggle would think that they are doing just the most normal thing. And people in high intensity struggle would be either rolling their eyes or with a stomach ache or wanting to leave. But they can't do that sometimes because they are also invested in the relationship. Or sometimes they, there's something like if, uh, if we're thinking about gatherings, for example, where we are discussing possibilities for networking, there's something in there for them. But they have to endure all this yeah. normalized pattern of conversation and of relationship that, that are sometimes very damaging, but people don't, um, don't recognize it. And if you call it out when it's happening, then the person who did it probably falls apart. And then there's the fragility. Then there's a lot of crying, mm. loss of face and all. And we don't want any of that. These are traps. We don't, it's very difficult to get out of that. We want to prepare people before they get into the space to get into the space with humor, with looking at themselves in a humorous way, but not trying to make jokes. That's not what we're trying to do. Otherwise people understand it differently. But to be able to hold the difficult things from a generative space. Mm. And sometimes we bring, uh, there's two poems on the website. One is, want to be an ally? And the other one is called, I can't hold space for you anymore. <laughs> Sorry. So the want to be an ally is calling out uh, people who want to engage as a matter of, uh, as an economy, so a transactional economy. So I'm, Gonna, I want to be seen as being your friend. I want our photo on Facebook together. Um, I want uh, your knowledge on my PhD even, right? So that's, these are transactional forms of relationship that um, are part and parcel of our modern culture and that they are encouraged and rewarded in the modern culture, but they're extremely harmful um, in other ways, right? So how do we interrupt transactions um, so that we can have relationships based on accountability, trust, reciprocity, um, and in this long-term commitment for the well-being of each other, right? Mm -hmm. That is not just, well, uh, it's not just an event. It is a lifelong and, li and, and, and life-wide commitment. So these are the kinds of things that um, we're thinking about. We work also from the point of view of denial, so if you're working with the unconscious, um, there are four denials that... Um, okay, yes, tell us a bit about that, that because I think, so I, I want to, we, we don't have a lot of time yet. I would like yeah. us to really explore a bit in this final part of our conversation, concrete things people can bear in mind, be, be attentive, so that when they are in the process of trying to see... Uh, if their way of thinking is being, you know, excluding or if they are meeting a situation from a very close perspective that doesn't allow engagement, connection, this, like, what is the things that people can do? So these four can denials, you, uh, these four denials are quite denial. important because we want to, we, we, we want to refuse dealing with our own inner difficult stuff and the other stuff. And 
yeah, I think the, the, the main point here is that if you can sit with your own complexity and of, of uh, we, we have a metaphor of a bus, a full bus of people inside of you with different decks where there's even non-human beings in there, but there's a, a driver and passengers that you know, passengers you don't know, passengers you know a little bit of, if you can't deal and sit with that, you will never be able to sit with the complexity in front of you. You'll be projecting. Yeah. And these projections can be very violent, especially if they come from dominant culture to marginalized cultures that are that are used to this, but used to the violence of it. Um, so learning to identify projections requires you to learn to what's going on in your in your unconscious and what the the pile of shit it requires you to expand the capacity to deal with that it, it requires all of that but the project the fundamental denials we talk about in the project are four there's the denial of complicity and harm the, the denial that what we do in every day it's is part, part of, of historical systemic ongoing violence so we want to see ourselves as innocent and as people in the good team so that's one and, and yeah yeah, we, we, we would, we'd like that. We want that coddling. The second denial is the denial of unsustainability, that the, the planet has limits and that shit is coming, <laughs> like the different kind of shit. So yeah, COVID shit. may be just the first wave. Yeah, yeah, we're going to have a shit storm. There's actually a text called the shit storm category uh, on the website. <laughs> um, so we, there's much more coming and we will have to figure out how to do this. Otherwise, we'll start shooting each other. That's that's the, the logical response. The third denial is the denial of entanglement, the fact that we're part of a bigger metabolism. In ecological movements, it has really been more about the earth is an extension of myself. It's actually the other way around. The other way around, yeah. And we have to come to terms with our temporality. We have to come to terms with that. We need... Um, we need both AA for humanity and the doula for hospicing humanity, for hospicing modernity, right? Uh, in that sense, for us to be able to resent uh, this accountability that we have forgotten. And the last one, which affects uh, change movement, is the denial of the depth and magnitude of the problem. So our problems, uh, we tend to go for what we feel is possible and uh, safe and um, manageable. But what is actually needed is for us to, to have a very different approach to change, to be able to tackle um, it with, like, first thing is compost the shit. Otherwise, there's I, no start. I have a perfect example for that is how easy it was for, for us collectively to deal with COVID because in a way our response is much more habitual of control and mm -hmm. you know trying to eradicate while you know much more children die of starvation every year millions of people around the world we forget that, yeah. and that's we cannot deal with that and we are all kind of co accomplices on that so it's because because it's so yeah. much more complex it demands all the other denials to be put in check somehow. In yeah. yeah, no, that's a good example. Mm -hmm. I, I got you a bit in context, and, and I was thinking like, okay, so we need to be aware of our denials and how they interfere or, or how they affect the way we show up and how they affect the way we see and we respond to the challenges we have. Either it's a conflict within ourselves in, in, in a group or in the larger societal level. I wonder what, what other things you think would be useful, partic particularly for people that want to, you know, that want to kind of um, move away from the habitual patterns when dealing with difficult issues and, and, and addressing the complex issues and and being able to kind of start to move towards being in such kind of space you know in a, in a way that you can that that can be generative because in the end of the day the purpose of all this is how we can move towards more healthy regenerative cultures not culture cultures because there's many ways yeah. to actually bring that to life but from your research from your work what have you been figuring out that really works like how you guys prepare to go on this field work and, and have these difficult conversations? 
So in terms of awareness, for example, we, we, we think it's 20% of the work. So the intellect can do everything and actually it can do, what it can do is super important, but it's, we say it's 20%. There's an effective work, there is relational work, there is work on the economies we operate, there is the, there's work that we have to do on cycles, how we feel part of cycles, and that includes aging and facing mm-hmm. that. But um, in practical ways, what we do is we do a lot of embodied work, artistic work, and work on the land. Uh, although the communities don't say this is artistic, because for them it's all integrated. This is a, again a concept of another mm-hmm. another uh, framework, um, and we do work with with the unconscious through the practices that they have as well, which includes fasting, for example, for four days, both food and water. Right? Uh, they have the medicines like rapé. They have many other medicines like sananga as well, nishpa. And these are practices that are part of the work of the collective. But I think the work of Dani D'Emilia, who is a Brazilian and I know Dani. Italian. So she has a practice called, one of the practices called radical tenderness that tries to summarize what in the body needs to change as you prepare to receive the pain and compost the shit. So one, I'll just give one example of a practice that she does. She does lots of exercises with the body. Before it would, it required us to be like in pairs. Or I, I'm not sure how it's going to work now that we can do that. But one of the practices was to put a, a, a block of ice, a large block of ice between your body and another body. And depending on um, the level of, of intimacy that you have already, some of the bodies might even be naked in a workshop, right? So depending if they're artists, they might go in that direction. They if they're do. educators, then you just put no, your yeah. sleeve up <laughs> and put it here. <laughs> so a, a large block of ice here between you and, and, and another body. I'm just using my, my arm as an example. And she would take you through the process of feeling the numbing, feeling the pain of the, the cold, until you, that block of ice is uh, melted, melted between the two bodies, right? And receiving that water, that water going through the rest of your body and preparing yourself to receive the warmth of another body and warming up together. So that's the kind of thing uh, in terms of uh, the sensation or the, the sensuality of it that we're talking about, right? And Eros has also a part to play in it, although, again, it can be confused. Um, the work through pain has a part of it, but it has to be felt. If you're just thinking about it, yeah, yeah, twenty percent of the work. I, I was precisely thinking that that that's such a uh, an important work because if if the the one of the common problems with conflicts is that people get triggered and physically they have their own all reactions with the vagus nerve and all the different nervous system that put them in a place that they cannot just you know be be in that place where you can hold the conversation that needs to be held or be in an open space of observation. So, yeah, to be able to, to kind of become aware of the, what you experience physically, not being in the trigger of the situation allows you to be pre- better prepared to see like, okay, I'm feeling such some trigger. I know what's going to happen. I can see the, st- the, the stage is coming so I can better call myself maybe and start to breathe deeply or, you know, work, yeah. work. Through the through the, the emotions, wow! And if you use the metaphors or the analogies and stories and rhythms and things like that, you're bypassing the defenses of the ego. But the ego will protect that control, right? People don't want to lose that because their security is, is based on that. So, inviting people to find another place of security in the body, in the metabolism, in in trust that is 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 quite hard. It's it's quite enjoyable too. So composting shit could be a composting shit party, but um, there's also a risk there that people turn that again into a consumption exercise, right? So a lot of the times when we when we bring uh, done these exercises too soon in a process without raising the shit a bit, what happens is that people just want to feel good with that, and they do make you feel good. Right? Even going through the pain of the, the the ice gives you an epiphany on something else in your life that 
you need to deal with. And this is good. Like the personal thing is good. But if we're, if we're trying to create a practice that allows us to deal with collective shit, that part, that difficult part, that uncomfortable part, that painful part needs to, to be kept in the room, um, like constantly. And that's what people don't like. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I was I, just I thinking that. that this is such a big challenge because when we go, when when we meet a group and people are trying to work together for to bring to life something that they find important that unites them, but you know we there's all of us carry so much of that pack of shit on on our on our backs, and and some of them very painful. That is just like. I don't want to. I don't want to be in in that pain again. Or I just want to, yeah. you know. I want to. I want to be feel good, have fun. Uh, so it's really how to con- how to uh, invite how to invite people to that and to really kind of co- kind of that uh, uh, support them in becoming aware that the problem is the solution. It's not that you need to avoid the problems. You need actually to 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 look at them because they yeah. are. They are the solution. They it's are interesting because the, the solution is the problem, and the problem is the solution. Yeah, yeah. That's a very good one. Of course, <laughs> <laughs> it's not mine. Actually, I've, uh, in, in in terms of copyrights, I'm like, there's nothing that's mine. I'm just like channeling. <laughs> I'm like that too. <laughs> Creative Commons, everything. So yeah, it's, we, we are getting really to the, in the end of the conversation. I don't know if there's something else you wanted to share. Uh, that you feel still important to say. I mean, we just touched the surface of what what this kind of work on looking at deco- decolon- decolonizing ourselves from ingrained ideas and ways of thinking that get us stuck in in patterns of exploitation and and the exclusion and and privilege and power and rank. So yeah, just I hope. Everybody at home listening to us is uh, and seeing us is uh, is got interested in this conversation to go and dive a bit more into your work and the work of other people that are doing on this. That's really really important, I would say. But please let tell me if there's something else you'd like to add. I think part of the work we do is also to to learn from spaces where there's toxic criticality, where there's just this self righteous thing to try to to outsmart everybody with your or our moral superiority thing. And on the other hand, you have other spaces where people just go along to get along in this toxic positivity. That so how do we bring together um, the generative side of critique and the generative side of actually wanting to walk uh, or dance uh, in, in a generative way? So that we can have these difficult conversations or relationships don't fall apart so that we can show up to compost the shit together and then open up uh, something that is unthinkable right now and imaginable, but viable if you do that work first and not just um, waste a lot of time and resources consuming these other solutions mm-hmm. that make us feel good, but that at the end of the day are, are the problems. Right? Yes, so, it's it's like this short term solutions. It's st- good strategies for the short term, but on the long on the long haul, it's they don't they are keeping us stuck in patterns of destruction. So and the waste. Think about the waste of time, and then when things fall apart, the waste of being that ditch and not being able to come out, and then the infantilization and the safety blanket and the candy. No. And after that, we need to grow up, step up, show up differently, and move. <laughs> but not necessarily <laughs> forward. It's not a forward. We, we need to move deeper, probably. In Portuguese, we have this uh, saying that o buraco é mais embaixo. <laughs> Find this buraco. <laughs> so it's like the hole, the hole is a bit down. A bit, it's more down. It's <laughs> deeper than the It's thing. deeper, yeah. Oh, Vanessa, thank, thank you so you much. Thank you for the opportunity for this conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, me too, me too. I hope we have more in the future. Thank you for, for your time and, and generosity. Um, yes, it has been a real pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I would just say that um, the 
Raiders exercise on the on the website, the storm exercise, and the new text of radical tenderness that is coming up with Dani de Emilia are good starting points. I think if people are interested in in learning more about what this can do. Yes, there are also you, articles. You, but... you find the link together with this uh, interview so that you can um, follow yeah. up and and check a bit more of their tour, their work. I really encourage you to do so. It's amazing. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you. Thank you.